imagine you're sitting in a projection room. There's other people behind you about to see a type of alchemy come to life as Frankenstein's monster rises from the cauldron like a demon and slowly begins to take shape. This is the stuff of nightmares that no one has ever seen before because the year is 1910 and this is the first quite liberal adaptation of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. There is quite a type of almost stagecraft quality to this version of the story because of the fact that the actors turn around and also often mug for the camera, if you will. Nevertheless, it still works because we're talking about a time period where most people would be much more familiar with the theater and not film, which was still a developing language. When the creature finally reveals itself in its true horrific form, we see just a glimpse of its flesh. Sure, it might seem funny, like a, some kind of Halloween decoration, but yet when you do look at it and you consider the fact that this was for its time and still holds up pretty well, cutting edge effects, we have the creation of probably one of the most interesting screen monsters and maybe even underappreciated. Its first glimpse with a long fingered hand. This is the stuff of nightmares. If I was a little kid seeing this even today, I think I would be frightened. Indeed, capturing the late 18th century look of the piece, we have the use of mirrors to convey the doppelganger effect between Frankenstein and his creation. Would you say that his creation is evil? I don't think so. This is not something that has to be in this world. As far as we know, it, from the, what we are shown in this version of the story, it seems to have been brought together through some sort of magic, or as I said before, alchemy. But as we can see, as it hides behind the curtain, this is a creature that will never find acceptance from humanity. And upon realization of this horror and its base desires to perpetuate its own species, if you will, the undead demon-like creature demands a companion of his own and then sees the horror of what it is and what is to become. There has always been a bourgeoisie quality, I think, to the Frankenstein story. You could especially see it in James Well's version. This blood red type of filter used in the film evocative of something that is going to happen that we know now will be dreadful for all involved. Hence, as the bride-to-be turns in for the night, the screen will to totally and precisely begin to fade to blue. The blue being a kind of dead, cold structure of a thing that in its short period on earth has only known the cold. It looks almost like something Tim Burton could would have drawn as a kid or something like that. And this is not to make fun of it at all. It's actually, in my humble opinion, a very original, or if not the original, Frankenstein's monster. Now we see what will become of the final confrontation. And one might argue that this is not 
a battle of wills so much as a battle of the soul where one half of Frankenstein's monster, which is himself Frankenstein, has accepted his fate and becomes a part of the mirror, but not without Frankenstein himself entering and seeing himself upon the monster's demise. Now we see a false triumph uh, take effect as even then people wanted a happy ending. The restoration credits follow this short film. Thank you for your time.